parenting this week, and I find myself um, writing in the cards of baby showers that I'm going to the first time mom, you know, something to the effect of get ready for the most humbling journey in life other than marriage, I think, because I know that's how it's been for me. Um, I started out with a lot of pride and arrogance, I think, in my parenting. It kind of felt a lot like there was a formula that I was going to follow that was going to equal perfect children or something. You know, you look at how your parents did things and it could be good or in between or bad and you want to tweak a few things and you kind of get it in your mind like if, if I tweak just the right things I'm going to get it perfect and then um, I'm going to have amazing children and then God just cuts you off at the knees and humbles you and shows you your failures and um, your weaknesses and how much you need him in parenting because how many times do you have to cry out for wisdom on just an hour by hour basis to be able to to know what to say to your child or how to lead them and, um, you really have to know god you have to be close to god so that you can speak truth into their life and with kids you can't like hide they see all of you and they see whether or not you're in the word and if you're living out what you say and they're very quick to perceive um hypocrisy or you know she's saying one thing but doing another and so, parenting is just a, it's a big deal. Yeah, I, I know for me it was, it, like we said, it's, it's humbling and you, you, you do things as parents that you just thought you would never do, like in a bad way. Like I remember even our oldest, I mean, she wasn't even two years old, I remember just picking her up from her crib because she was just screaming at her and just yelling at her like, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing just, just going, shut up. I just remember just screaming <laughs> at her face and then putting her down in the crib and going, what did I just, I, I just yelled at like this one and a half year old baby. Like who, who am I? Where, where's this anger coming from? And I remember just going out in the living room and just going, God, this isn't, I didn't even know that's in me. Like how, how much like ugliness, um, I remember when the second child, Mercy, was born. I, I, just, I still don't know. We're walking, we're strolling her, and she's just crying. And again, it's just that noise. It was just like, shut up. Like, that's like my go-to word. Like, I, it, it just, and I'm going, what, have I not grown? You know, you're three, four years later, and it's embarrassing sometimes when you see your own anger, and then you see the faults in their lives, and. Um, in their character, and you realize, wow, that, that came from me. There's just, just so much refining that takes place. And I don't know, it's just been like such a crazy journey. And like, like Lisa said, you realize then so much isn't even up to you because as you get refined and start growing, and then you can almost get arrogant, like, man, we're pretty good parents. These kids are gonna love the Lord. And um, you realize you don't even have control over that. Uh, biblically, that's in the Father's hands, and there's something that you can't make your kids fall in love with Jesus. There's that moment when that happens, if that happens, and that's largely dependent on the Lord. And I'm not going to get into a theological debate right now, but you do have to surrender and go, okay, Lord, I, I need your spirit to fall upon Rachel, on Mercy, on Ellie, on Zeke, on Claire, on whatever this one's going to be, you know, just, I, I need your help. Um, and it's almost like we don't treat our kids like, um, I don't know what to say, like, like, what, like we treat other Christians. Like sometimes, um, like when we're counseling other people, like we appeal to the Holy Spirit in them and, and think of them as just these human beings in need of a savior. And sometimes when you're raising your kids, you almost feel like, no, I can just do this um, by my rules and by my parenting methods. And you don't treat them like Christians. And, and uh, you, you don't treat them as people who are going to be lights into the world. Um, it's almost like you're, well, at least for us ladies, maybe, 
you're so emotionally attached and invested in it that you can't even remove yourself enough to be able to not be so overwhelmed by their sin or not to be so, um, I don't know what the right word is. Like you're, it's just so much easier to be, to be overcome with all this emotion towards your own children that, you know, your niece or your nephew could come over and say, hey, hey Aunt Lisa, I need some advice on this. And you can step back, you know, mm -hmm. say, well, here's what I see, you know, here's some choices and, and this is what I would do, but, you know, and you offer this advice because there's a tiny bit of detachment, right? But with your children, it's like, you know, you just stress out and you go into this. Like when, at one point I had to go to our oldest and say, you know what? I, I have to apologize to you. I think I'm trying to be your Holy Spirit. And she looked at me funny and she said, really? I, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, yeah, I just am so, I so want you to follow God and, and do all the right things that I'm just like, over doing it. It's like I'm this little voice on her shoulder, like, you know, do this. No, Rachel, go this way. And the poor girl is like, you know, well, she only needs one Holy Spirit. And it's not yeah. me. <laughs> I remember one time, like, she showed me how I was wrong in something. And I just was like, you know what? You're right. She's like, I am? Like, this <laughs> look of, you're admitting you're wrong. And I'm thinking, I always admit I'm wrong. And I start thinking back, I really don't. Um, I always think I'm right. <laughs> I usually am. <laughs> but it just, you know, there's there's even some practical things that, um, you know, we didn't get too into in the book, but I just heard this two weeks ago, and I didn't make it up, and uh, I don't know who originated it, but they were talking about in parenting, a lot of times, you know, we let our kids run free because that's just kind of what the world tells you to do, is not to discipline them. Don't, don't, don't squash them in any ways. And, and then as they get older, the stakes get higher and you suddenly try to grab control. And they said it, it just doesn't work that way. It's, it's like starting off like this and letting them run the house. And then later on, you know, trying to grab control, whereas really it should be the opposite of when they're young, really raising them up in the way of the Lord, keeping them close to you. Um, you know, not letting them throw the tantrums and fall on the floor and chew on the rug and cry. and scream and cause you, you know it's like no 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 we're not gonna have that and then as they grow you're just slowly releasing 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 to the time when they're in high school it's like man because we trained you up in these early years it's like you know what's right or wrong you can make the decision and we're even telling the kids like i i want to get to that point with you where maybe you're 16 and you don't even have to ask anymore just tell me where you're going because i trust you you know we've had this and and have slowly, slowly let go. And um, I don't know that I can prove that biblically, but it's just a cool little thought. Mm. Not good. I agree. Good. She agrees. <laughs> so this wasn't meant to be like a parenting book <laughs> by any stretch and giving you all the methods. In fact, even in talking about this, I had said years ago we would never talk about parenting or do a parenting book or anything like that because you you don't want that pressure on your kids like they've got to be perfect or this or that um, and so we're not trying to do that or say that um, I guess we're just trying to add another element into parenting which is helping your kids see that um, mom and dad love each other we're focused on the kingdom first Follow our example as, as we follow Christ and giving them that type of eternal perspective um, even when they're little. Um, so don't judge our kids. <laughs> um, but all we're saying is one of the things we try to do well is be in agreement with one another, um, be one so they understand unity and what it means to um, work together and follow one spirit. Um, we have one king, one kingdom, and you know, that's what we live for, and we're hoping they see that and follow that example. Um, and I don't think it was always that way. I think we, we were so into safety and just 
afraid of so many things. You know, like typical parents, you can bring that baby home and say, oh, that's not, we're gonna do something wrong. And, and I mean, because that's terrifying. Um, you, no one taught you how to do this. It's just, once the nurses are gone and you bring this child home, you just immediately go to safety and health. And, and, and then sometimes we never grow out of that um, and realize, no, it's about eventually releasing them, like training them well and releasing them and letting them grow in their walk with the Lord, which you would think would be natural for me because you know all the deaths of my parents and really just grew up, it was me and God, and yet now that I have kids, I wanna be their savior and protect them from everything rather than recognizing, no, God had his way with me and had to teach me and, and I had to grow in my walk with the Lord and I don't wanna rob children of that um, by taking too much control. Pam, I think um, it's going to take a conscious effort as a couple for you guys to um, hold your children loosely, to <clears throat> remember who they belong to, and like I said in the book, who you belong to, because again, everything is about we are all here for God's glory. So. If God asks you to release your child in some way that is hard for you or is a struggle for you, then you're going to have to have enough trust in your walk with God and love for God that you're going to choose Him even over your idea of safety or concern over your children. I guess, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's very easy to let parenting rule you rather than to let God rule you and to let God rule your children and their lives. And he may have amazing things for them to do. And again, you don't want to stand in the way of what God's going to do in their lives. And so you have to, you have to lay them down at the Lord's feet constantly, I feel like, because that desire to protect them and have them just experience no hardship and no suffering is so strong. We all feel it as parents. I mean, that's, that's the love God gave us for them, but it can very easily overwhelm your whole family life, and then you've stood in the way of something that God was about to do through your kids and your own. Yeah, and, and as you were talking, I was thinking about how some of you watching this are like, I don't know, like I said, parenting's humbling, and you may just look at yourself and go, gosh, I'm really failing in this area. My kids are gonna follow my example. I'm not this great example. And I'm just saying, I've seen the Holy Spirit change people, change me, change other parents. Um, and some of you go, gosh, but I have this background and this history of the way my parents treated me. And I'm just saying, no, God can change all of that. He, does he changes all of that I mean I I never had one conversation with my dad I never was hugged once by my dad and it's it's just he, he God really can be a father to the father so you have to trust his word like he changes you that's this is his desire to change you so don't be overwhelmed um, there, there's there's you know don't put so much pressure on yourself like you're the one that's gonna change your child's heart at the same time Focus on your own walk with the Lord. I mean, if you are truly walking with Him and growing closer and closer to Him, you're going to become a better parent. You're going to be a better example to your children. And so don't get so focused on the task as though this is all about, I want to be a better parent. Man, when you focus on, I want to become more and more like Christ. I want Him to purify me of all the garbage in my life. I want the Holy Spirit to put to death the anger, the pride, the jealousy, all of those things, as you focus on that, you're gonna be a better parent. Um, but some people focus so much on the task of being a great dad, being a great mom, that they forget, you know, let me just, again, abide in Christ. Let the Holy Spirit change me. And it's gonna be caught and uh, understood by the kids. Those that are parents, any of this relate to you? Do you ever find yourself wanting to be that protector? 
I really struggled with the, oh, by the time they get 16, I just want to let them go. <laughs> I, I think around 18 or 19, I started to let them go because they were technically adults. But I still worry constantly from wanting to protect them. And I don't know if it's any different. Maybe all parents are the same, but I, I, you hear the correlation between dads and daughters and you just, the world's not going to hurt my little girl. Ever. And that struggle of how do I be the protector and still let them go to learn how to become like their mom, how to become women of God, how to become fighters in the kingdom. For those that are parents, what's what's the scariest thing you ever had to do with your kid? I was paranoid to let mine go to children's church because I knew their prayer requests were going to be for me. <laughs> I didn't want the children's church teacher to know what they knew about me. I'm just being honest. I mean, because as they talked about in the book, we can be something at church and we can be something at work and we can be something at our extended family, but our kids are with us all the time. They know the truth. They know what's going on. They know if you're living it, if you're walking it. They know everything about you. And we try to consider, you know, they're, they're just kids. They, they don't get it. I can tell you, as soon as they start walking, they get it. I distinctly remember bringing the first one home. Tanya and Sister Judy were there, and, and you know, we had 28 pillows, 300 jackets and everything around the car seat facing the wrong direction in the back seat in the middle of the whatever and carried her in on a cloud and put her in the bassinet and then I went out to get something else out of the car and her mother and her grandmother were both in the kitchen leaving her in the living room by herself what is wrong with you people you can't leave her in there by her. well she's in the bassinet she's not going anywhere sure enough I went in there she hadn't gone anywhere but there were things that we had to learn as parents through the first and through the second and, and the different stages of their lives that, that, again, this book is not about being parents. It's not really, in my opinion, as much about being married to your spouse as it is preparing for eternity, preparing ourselves for what we're, when we're going to see God. And in this particular chapter and next chapter, preparing those that God entrusted us with for them to see God. You know, we bring our children into the sanctuary and we dedicate them to the Lord. We give them back to him, so we say. Usually this is three to six months of age. We're, we're giving them back, God. You gave them to us and you put them in our care and we're going to give them back to you. Until this afternoon, whenever I say, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. I'm not going to, no, 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 no. I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to trust the Holy Spirit to keep my children safe. And, and those that don't have children yet, if you ever do... You'll, it'll make sense. Those that have lived, at least in my house, know what I'm talking about, know all the aspects of what I'm talking about. So I pulled out several of the scriptures that we may or may not get through them all. Um, it's the same text in the book for next week's workbook. There's no actual chapter in the book um, in the same video. So if we don't get through all of them tonight, we can do the rest of them next week. But are you guys good with just volunteering for which ones as we go around or down the board? Or? Who wants John 14, 15? I got it. Mark 12. 1 John 3. Okay. Sandy, do Deuteronomy. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants 1 Timothy? I'm rolling. I am not putting up with this nonsense. John 3. I'll do John 3. I got 2 Timothy. Hebrews 10. I'll do it. Romans 9. I'll do it. Go ahead. Who's got it? Who's got Philippians? Who didn't have one? Wade and Dawn. Luke 9. Dawn and Wade. Matthew 10.
John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Mark 12, 28 through 31. <laughs> what? So the moment starting that didn't have to go get a Bible. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And in 1 John 4, 19 through 21. Oh, no. I thought it said 3 on. <laughs> on the screen, oh, the screen said 3. Is it 3 or is it 4? It's 4. Okay. Um, it's on the board, right? Don't give me that look. So I'm just kidding. Okay. It's up there, right? On the other screen, it's 3. Right. It's on the other board. It said 3, 19 through 21. That's what I got. We love him because he first loved us. It's further than that. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For who does not love his brother whom he has seen? How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. What's the similarities between those three scriptures? Love God. More than anything. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second one is like it, that you love your neighbor and or you love your brother. Because I've got a t-shirt that says, I gotta love my Muslim neighbor. I gotta love my homosexual neighbor. I gotta love, and you just keep filling in the blank. It's actually all the way down through here. And then the latter one's just a blank. Love your blank neighbor. Because we do have to love those that don't like us, that don't love us, that want us dead, that don't believe like we do, that don't believe the Bible, those that have a different faith altogether. The Bible tells us we have to love them. And here's what gets me is if you go to John 13, 34 and 35, it's not just love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to the disciples, this is how you are to be known, that you love one another as I have loved you. That took me a deeper level here six, eight weeks ago. I mean, I'm coming back from Atlanta and listen to a podcast, and I'd always stopped with, I like me pretty good. I like to wear clothes. I like to eat. I like to have heat in my house. I like to have air conditioning. I love my dog. I love my wife and my kids. And I, all these things I love about me, I can love my neighbor that way. But now I have to love my neighbor, to love one another, to love those that don't like me, that hate me, that want me dead, as Jesus did. That's how I'll be known. That's how I'll be known as a disciple, that I love them like he did. And, well, I read in the Bible, he died for me. Right. That, that's another level. That's now, you know, my neighbor, and I'm not going to say his name in case he happens to find this video, so they don't know which one I'm talking about, but I don't like his dog. I don't like the way he leaves him out in the middle of the night barking and calling my dogs to bark. I don't, I don't like that, but I still have to love him. You know what? If, if the bad guys come from across the street that want to shoot up the neighborhood, i got to love him enough that I'm willing to die for him. That's a whole nother level of love. Mm -hmm. And the scripture that Carrie was reading is, how can you say you love God if you don't even love the people that you can see here? We, have you ever seen God? Who's seen God? Face to face. Since he's dead. What? Since he's dead. That's true. That's what he told Moses. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock because no man can look at me. Isaiah saw the train of his robe but didn't see God. So who's seen God face to face? Nobody has seen him face to face. So if we've not seen him and we say we love him, how can you say you love him when you can't love those that are right here in Canapa? Salisbury. I was on the end of the street today. If you can't love those people that are walking down the sidewalk that don't like you, how can you say you love God? If you can't love those people that are homeless in San Antonio, if you can't love those people that are homeless in downtown Charlotte, if you can't love the people that really want you dead, that are planning against us right now in some foreign country that they just assume all of us infidels be murdered, we have to love them as Jesus loved us. That, I can't get past that. 
because it was a new revelation to me. I'd read the scripture a dozen times, but it hit me coming back listening to that preacher talk on that podcast of that's how I'm supposed to be known. I mean, I, I want to be known for lots of things, but I hadn't thought about I need to be known for loving people like Jesus loved them. That, that's a pretty tall order. Who's got Deuteronomy, Sandy? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Since you have the Bible, what's verse 9 say? Think ten continues on, doesn't it? Finishing it shall your be when the land your God brings you into the land that they should show your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you laws and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of olive trees, vineyards, and vineyards which you did not till, hill houses where you did not dig, vineyards with olive trees, which you did not plant, and vineyards which you did not till, and vineyards which you did not plant, which you did not till, vineyards which you did not plant, 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 <laughs> the blessing went four through nine, but then he starts explaining in verse 10 where she continued to read exactly what we heard preached at the Women of Vision Conference, that, that we're going to live in houses we didn't build. We're, we're going to harvest from vineyards and from trees and from things we didn't even plant. You know what? I, I live today because of people I never met's prayers. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Smiths and the Eastums two generations ago prayed for whoever she was going to meet, and I never got to meet them. That's why I decided when we had kids, I'm going to pray for their spouses before they meet them, before they are. When they were little babies, I'm writing letters to God about these people, these possible men and husbands. One's here, one's a probable, possible, whatever P word you want to put in there. But I want that to be something that they can look back at later in life like I can now and say, you know, had it not been for the prayers of those before they knew me. I hope that Jonathan can actually look and go, you know, these struggles that he's had through his life and the things that he's had to identify with, and I'm not going to go into that here, but he can see that there were prayers coming from somebody that didn't even know him, had never met him. He wasn't part of our life yet. I was praying for him, and I didn't know I was praying for him. I didn't know him by name. I didn't know what he looked like. I just knew I wanted to pray for whoever was going to meet my daughter. That whole protective custody. And who am I going to turn over custody to? And I think you even got quizzed at the wedding. Oh, I think your answer to me was asking, can you take my princess to be your queen? That's my prayers coming true. Somebody that's going to say, you're going to love her like I loved her. You're going to love her more than I loved her because that's why I prayed for you so that you can have that Holy Spirit empowering you to be the husband that you need to be, to be the man that you need to be, to be the person that you need to be as you walk out the rest of these days because we're not going to always be here to protect our children. 1 Timothy 6, 15, 15 through 16. Which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. What does it mean, only sovereign? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the blessed and only sovereign. What does that mean? In control. You mean tell me God's the only one that's in control? Mm -hmm. Couldn't have told me that when we were married two, three years in. We were in control. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when we talk about the king of kings? And you notice it's the capital K of the lowercase k. What, what does that mean when you're trying to explain it to your kids? We're just trying to explain it to ourselves. Whenever you read that, the king of kings... You know, here we're reading it in 1 Timothy, but it comes again in, in Revelation. 
that he's going to come down on a white horse and down his leg will say king of kings and lord of lords. And he's going to have the sword of fire. What does that mean? Anybody? He's over everything. How about alone has immortality? Anybody in here immortal? Dwells in an unapproachable light. That goes back to that. Anybody seen God before? Yeah. Yeah. Honor and eternal dominion. Are we eternal? Hmm? No. No. Eternal means no beginning and no end. Did we have a beginning? We're what they call avaternal. So we have no end. But we have a creation. We would have a creation date. When we had those two cells come together in our mother's womb, we were created. He put a soul in us, and we grew from there. And he knitted us together in our mother's womb, wonderfully made. And he knew plans about us before we were ever born and before we ever stepped into those plans. He's known all these things, and he's known about all things because he's timeless. There is no beginning. There is no end. But God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are the only things that is eternal. Even the angels were created. Anything that has a creation date doesn't have an end, but that's considered as eternal, not eternal. So the only eternal beings ever is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we had a beginning, but we have no end, we're as eternal, but what does that mean for us? What does it mean that we're not going to have an end? We're going to spend eternity somewhere. We're going to die this side of heaven. The word says we all have an appointment to die once. These bodies, as Carrie was going in, these mortal bodies are going to get stuck in the ground if we die before the rapture happens. And then when he comes again, these bodies are going to raise up and be joined with our souls, our spirits in the air, and we're going to be glorified, and we're going to be like him. I had a conversation with somebody last week. I don't know what somebody being, maybe it was in our class Sunday. I don't know what glorified bodies are made out of. But I'm looking forward to finding out. I really want to know. Well, I don't care what it is then. I'm just going to be glad that I'm there experiencing it. Amen. Your knees won't hurt. Right. That's for sure. Yeah, that rheumatologist can just have all his nonsense. John 3 and 30. Oh, that's beautiful. He must increase, but I must decrease. Who? Who? What is the well, scripture? Capital, scripture talking about? Capitalized, but it's talking about God. It's talking about Jesus. Because who said it? It wasn't in red. Uh, I'm sure red on here. It wasn't in red. Who said it? Who said it? Yeah. John did it. John who? <laughs> John. Not John the disciple. John who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist said that he must increase. I didn't know there was going to be a test. It means I must decrease. But what have we been talking about for months now? Getting ourselves out of the way. That's another way of saying this exact thing. If we want him to increase, then we've got to decrease. We've got to get out of the way. We've got to stop having our thoughts take over what it is that we're going to do, what we think we're going to do, because we need to follow the Holy Spirit and continue to follow the steps that he would lead us to, where he would guide us to. We've got to get out of the way so that he can increase, because that's how the message is going to get out. 